Okay, so we start again with the, the last segment of the source to sync uh, system, and that's the basin. And so here is simply just uh, a representation, if you want, of the um, of its anatomy. And so what I wanted to show there, it's again one of the, the, the drawings. So again, I just put, um, okay, let's start by the small one here. The small one here is, is simply to represent a continental uh, crust becoming oceanic crust, okay? Um, so it's one, one specific context of passive margin, but what I want to show uh, more generally is that you have a flux of sediment coming in this segment whether it's delivered directly from the source or through a transfer zone. But this flux coming in is deposited. Okay, and because it's deposited, and I did those arrows here, because it's deposited, progressively, you have less and less sediment to deposit. And that's why you end up with nothing to deposit anymore at the end. This is why we have a prism sedimentaire in the ultimate uh, sink, in the ultimate basin. It's a wedge, a sedimentary wedge. You just extract sediment along the transport uh, path of sediment. And so as you extract it at some point, you finish extracting and you have zero sediment left to deposit. So there is no sediment going out of the basin. That's the definition. Of course, you have transfer basins. Uh, so in a, in a way, the transfer system is itself a basin because it stores sediment on geological timescales. Um, but the ultimate basin uh, is that one that has no uh, QS out. This is uh, I'm, I'm not going to put this on the final version of this uh, of this Vademecum, but N a n is not a number. QS out is not defined. You could have QS out is zero. Okay. If you see none like this, it's not. Uh, it's not Indian bread. It's. Uh, it's uh, simply uh, not a number. Okay. So this is the notion of a sedimentary wedge. You have a pinch out at the end. Your 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 geometries they pinch out. There is also you can also. Think about it as a downlap. Okay. Um, and you remember the, the veil uh, slug, the sequence stratigraphic slug? Uh, there's this big pinch out at the end. We, we'll see that on the next slide again, but um, that's, that's, the, that's the principle. Now, here on this, uh, on this little drawing here, what I wanted to show is a section again of the, of the of a, of a margin with geometries inside, uh, uh, retrograding geometries, prograding geometries. So that's that's a link to a sequence stratigraphy here. We have a river coming in with a QS in, uh, floodplain, and here the system becomes divergent. So you start to have bifurcation in your channels. So it's the contrary of the source area. In the source area, you have contribution. Your system is converging and becomes more and more efficient. Here, the system becomes divergent, it becomes less and less efficient, and it, and it deposits. OK? You have a delta. You have a shelf. And then you have a slope going down all the way into the basin, where you can have uh, deep sea fans under uh, into deep waters, uh, but not necessarily. And so, in a way, what I wanted to, to show here is that the basin is composed of a variety of depositional environments, which follow each other from, from upstream to downstream. 
Okay, they are continental fluvial here, shallow marine, deltaic coastal, shelf, slope, and deep sea uh, environments. Um, and all of this is along a, 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 a routing, uh, a dispersal system that has less and less sediment to deal with until it reaches zero sedimentation at some point. Okay. Um, of course, the locus, the, the, the place where you trap sediment in this system is going to be controlled a lot by different parameters. Tectonic is one, sediment supply is another one, and sea level is, is another one. You can imagine if you lower sea level suddenly, okay, your system is going to transfer a lot of sediment to the deep sea. Imagine your sea level goes down there, okay, you will suddenly have, you will suddenly transfer sediment and, and a lot of sediment will be deposited in the deep sea. On the contrary, if you, if your sea level goes up, you are going to, you know, your river will be like shocked. Uh, it won't be able to transfer sediment down and it will store a lot in the fluvial uh, and in the coastal realm. Um, Tectonics can be margin scale tectonics, but it can also be intra basin, uh, like linked with salt, trust, faults, faults. Okay, so there can, there can be intra basin tectonic. If you look, um, and I can do that now uh, at, a me, at an image of the Gulf of Mexico, it's very impressive. Um, let me do that here. Um, Gulf of Mexico, uh, but map. Um, I'm going to do that and to do window zoom. And we can take um, we can take for instance uh, this. Now this hopefully we can have a nice image. You see this image? You see this? This, yeah. uh, this is the yeah. Gulf of Mexico, and that's basically um, uh, I would say most mostly the slope. You know, it, the sediment they go down and they pinch out a lot here. Some of it continues huh? uh, because the map is not complete. You see some canyons. Okay, the coastline is here. So this would be more or less the shelf. Uh, and on this slope, you see a lot of holes and uh, hills. Okay. Uh, and some of them are very uh, actually circular. Okay, they almost look like crater craters. Uh, they are not craters. They are um, they are up and down uh, movement due to salt. You have diapirism. You know, salt is less dense uh, than the surrounding rocks. So there is a layer of salt. I believe in the Gulf of Mexico, it's a Jurassic uh, layer of salt. And on top of this layer of salt, you deposit a lot of sediment coming from the Mississippi. Okay, and, and the whole uh, interior of the, of the United States. And because you deposit all this salt onto this layer, oh, sorry, all this sediment onto this layer of salt, uh, it becomes unstable. And in some places, the salt uh, pierces, make a piercement through the sedimentary uh, layer and goes up. And so where it goes up, of course, it's taken out from the sides and it goes down in places. So you have kind of small little basins. You have, you have things going up like mushrooms and places where it goes down because of, uh, of uh, you withdraw salt uh, laterally. Okay. Uh, if I do cross uh, section Gulf of Mexico, salt diapias. Um, I'm sure we see that a lot. Yeah, that's what you see here, for instance. The principle is, 
is this one. Let's take images. And, and the tectonics due to that is, is very impressive. Okay. Can I see this picture? Uh, yeah, it's just one example, but here I think I believe the in black. Uh, this is a paper by um, Jackson, Hudik, Hudik, and Dooley, uh, 2010. And, and so you see here the salt going up, making these kind of hills. And then in between, you have kind of sag uh, basins uh, between two diapiers of salt, two piercements, and, and you have sedimentation there. And, and sometimes it's so intense that actually these things, they collapse down into the salt. There's so much salt that uh, this is what happens. Uh, and these are numerical uh, analog experiments where you use uh, silicon putty, you know, like those uh, relaxing balls that you use uh, with silicon. Uh, and if you put uh, a layer of silicon and then salt and then uh, sand on top with layers, you can do these, these, these nice images uh, and the salt goes up and we, people like this create very similar structure as what is observed in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Intrusive salt plumes, canopy margin truss systems, mini basins, alloctonous fragments, all of these are uh, what we can see uh, in, those, uh, in those basins. Um, okay, this is very common, but this is a whole uh, uh, domain of study, okay? Uh, but it's to say that there is tectonic also within the basin. And, and uh, that's important for transfer and for understanding depositional environments and sedimentary architecture in the basin. You also have a whole bunch of processes, but I wanted also to highlight by, by drawing this canyon here that cuts through the slope and into uh, the shelf, that you have canyons just as we saw before uh, onto this image of the Gulf of Mexico. So you also have, within the basin, you can also have erosion and cannibalism and recycling within the basin. And you also have transfer within the basin, okay? So, so the notion of source to sink is, um, you know, it, it has, I haven't explored this in detail, but you, you, you could probably explore uh, how fractal it is and how um, it repeats itself at different scales, you know? You can have a landslide feeding, uh, um, so you have a source where the, 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 the landslide goes from, and then it goes down into the small river. So at the scale of a, of a, of a single landslide, you have erosion and sedimentation. This con debuli that Betim was, uh, was mentioning yesterday that we've seen in Randa in the Alps, uh, you also have, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, um, the source, the drainage system of the Rhone uh, in, in, the, in, the Alpa, in the Alps here in Switzerland and the Rhone Delta that you can find um, in, the, in the Lake Geneva, the Rhone Delta that is uh, just uh, downstream of Martigny, okay? And that's a small source to sink system. And then the big source to sink system is the whole Alps and it goes into the Rhine or into the Rhone and it ends up in the Mediterranean Sea. But even in the Rhone Delta in the Mediterranean, you still have canyons and fan deltas at the bottom, or oh, oh, sorry, uh, deep sea fans at the bottom. Okay, so the source to sink concept uh, is really a multi-scale uh, concept. Okay, so I think we wrapped up on uh, on the basin. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Uh, can you just explain the mechanism of uh, the formation of um, those canyons, submarine canyons? It is because of uh, the energy of uh, the. Yeah, there are, there are different. Um, there is a whole bunch of uh, different um, possibilities and hypothesis, it's an active field of uh, research, very active. 
Um, just to say a few that come to my mind. Um, when you have a, a sea level fall, okay, mm. uh, you will have your river system extending onto the shelf and starting to cut into the shelf. And when the sea level rises again, you end up with a, with a, with a cut here. If it's not filled fully, then you have, a, you, have a, you have an erosion there that can then be used as a canyon and be extended down. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that when the river system here brings sediment, some of the sediment uh, with water uh, makes um, kind of density currents. So some of it is not fully deposited there. Some of it continues onto the shelf because there is a slope and because the, the water and the sediment itself make a, makes a, a mixture that continues onto the shelf. And this mixture may have uh, sufficient energy, especially if the gradient of the shelf increases near the, near the, 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 the edge and start uh, you know, um, eroding, start uh, reaching uh, sufficient energy that it starts, uh, that it becomes um, above the threshold for erosion, and you can initiate uh, erosion by those hyperpicnal uh, uh, currents on the shelf. Another process is when the shelf here, the, at the shelf edge or on the slope, maybe you have such a slope, even if it's low, we are speaking about low slopes, huh? maybe 3%, 3 percent, three meter per 100 meters. But since it's all unconsolidated sediment, at least for some places, maybe the slope becomes unstable just by itself or maybe because of earthquakes. Okay. And because of that, you may initiate here um, a landslide. Okay. Mm -hmm. The slope instability. And this landslide, this landslide, may grow upstream because you have a, a you, let's say you create a, a big scoop here of sediment that collapses down. Then you have a cliff and this cliff will perhaps retreat because of successive uh, collapse events and then reach the shelf edge and then work as a vacuum cleaner sucking uh, density currents and then transform progressively into a canyon. Okay, I can show you um, Let's go back here and let's see uh, this image of the um, um, California uh, coast bathymetry. I think there would be nice images there of that. Um, but maybe not. Um, how is this? Oh, yeah, hey, Google. Hmm. Je crois qu'il y a pas mal de fenêtres, donc ça prend un peu plus de temps. Ouais, j'ai des tonnes de fenêtres. <laughs> um, colored shaded relief. It's a pity because that's, I think, a beautiful map that will help. Maybe this one is going to be better. Slide player. You see this, uh, so you see this is Long Beach, uh, Los Angeles, and you see those canyons? Yes. They are actually quite beautiful, and I don't know uh, much about them, or actually nothing, but it seems that this one actually links to the coast. Mm -hmm. okay, so maybe it's now connected, but those here, they don't exactly link. Maybe they, we cannot see the link. Maybe mm, mm, you see there is some uh, here, there is low topography in this kind of uh, interfluve and some fluvial system probably. So maybe they link through uh, shelf currents, they link uh, to that, but maybe not. But you see here, for instance, these, these little canyons on the slope. Uh, yes. Uh, it's maybe very low resolution for you and, and for me, but they, I believe, 
uh, you have some slope instability that, that grows up and then reaches the shelf edge and then propagates. That's how I see it. Um, let's go the Zaire uh, coast, uh, uh, coast bathymetry. Actually, on, on, on Google Earth, we would, we would see this uh, probably really well, but images. Mm, it's not great. Uh, um, Taiwan um, straight bathymetry. Also not amazing. Maybe this. This is on the website of my uh, colleague Andrew Lin in Taiwan. But maybe the oh here the data are maybe uh, maybe good uh, A4 sized map, beautiful map. Uh, it's maybe good to see this. There is the depth to Mesozoic basement, but what I wanted to see, oh yeah, it's not exactly what I wanted to see, but here you basically have the coastline of Taiwan. Do you see that? Yes. There's a little line here. So this is Taiwan, this is China. This is the Taiwan Strait. It's a, it's a big fallen basin in front of the, the mountain range of Taiwan. And here you see there are very famous canyons that link up uh, to the to on land, so so these canyons are, are of the same time, and some of them they are already well uh, well um, well expressed on the slope. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see the, the 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 rest here, but some of them they go up all the way, all the way to the coast. Okay, so there are, there are a few, uh, ah, there, there, there's a few, there's a nice paper by, uh, I think, uh, Phil Danny, Phil Danny uh, um, Canyon uh, Initiation. Uh, submarine Channel Initiation, Feeling and Maintenance. Um, oh, that's maybe uh, by Jake Cobalt. Um, a brief review looking forward. So this is a group of uh, Andrea, Fildani, Jay Cobalt, um, Brian Romans. They've, they've worked a lot on this. So Betim, if you're interested, I can I can point you uh, out towards those uh, those canyons. Yeah, this is really a very, very interesting topic. OK. OK? Yes, thank you. Now, um, let me come back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so what I would like to start at least in the in the next uh, fifteen minutes is because we are in the basin. I made this figure um, trying to uh, to show um, sequence uh, the essentials of sequence stratigraphy. I would like to do something is to take off the screen this this bar here now share screen desktop to share how can i move ah excellent okay okay so now here you have the full uh, the full screen. Um, no. Um, so here is a. I try to synthesize um, different aspects, or let's say the. I think the important points that I want to convey about uh, sequence stratigraphy. Uh, that are important for us. So you can keep this uh, this figure. Um, it, it's it's meant to work as a uh, like a, a reminder. Uh, you can just try to try to 
to have all your sequence stratigraphy in one figure. So first, I'd like to say that sequences are building blocks of the stratigraphic record. Okay, so what I point in this first line here is that uh, we have sequences on passive margins in cratonic basins, in orogenic uh, peripheral uh, basins. And we speak about scales of, we, sp we speak about geological time scales, basically. It could be 20,000 years, but that's very short. It's 100,000 years, 1 million years, and more. But sequences are those building blocks. And they are a little bit like in a movie. In a movie, you have different sequences. OK? And, and uh, these are the moments you see on YouTube, for instance. Uh, if you watch, uh, you, you can watch uh, many, many sequences of, of, of movies on YouTube. Uh, you don't see the entire movie, but you see a sequence, a particular sequence. It has a beginning, it has an end, OK? And sometimes it repeats itself. There are several fight sequences in, a, in, a, in an action movie. Okay, and it always starts with the same. There is a provocation, uh, then the, 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 the fight starts, and then there is uh, somebody winning. Okay, and it's exactly the same for the sedimentary record. Uh, Peter Vail and colleagues, and many others actually, or Larry Sloss was the initiator of this, they, they uh, and others, you know, the ideas were shared by many at, at the same time often. Uh, they remarked that there are repetitive patterns, repetitive uh, motifs uh, in, in sedimentary uh, basins. So I take it from there, there or here, and I express it in two ways. That's the middle, middle line of the, of, the, of the diagram. Marine or continental. And again, I'm... Um, limiting myself to, uh, to um, the classic sedimentary record. I, I, I wouldn't go uh, into the carbonate uh, sedimentary record. And so in classic uh, sequences, here is the view that I think you should be able to draw, at least on principles. The sequence is made of system structs. OK? A tract is a suite, is a cortege, is an ensemble, uh, is, a, um, is a set of systems. Systems, there is a S, means different depositional systems, OK? So here, in the low stand systems tract, in uh, brown, you have deep sea fans, canyon, slope deposits, hemipelagic. You have a suite of different depositional environments, OK? Then you have in green the transgressive systems tract. OK. And here you have barrier islands, uh, coastal uh, tidal inlet, uh, tidal deltas. You may have uh, estuary. Um, you may have uh, tidal dominated deltas, uh, shelf, incised valley fields, a whole suite again of depositional systems that are different from the ones you would find during low stand uh, times. OK? And then you have the high stand in blue system tract. In the high stand system tract, you will have delta, shelf, fluvial uh, depositional systems, but more maybe river dominated deltas, uh, wave dominated deltas, etc. So you have a different suite of depositional environments. So the idea here is that during this, so that's a full sequence. And it's bounded below and above by a sequence boundary, SB. Um, 
that you can recognize in the sediments and on seismic sections. And the idea is that you can predict what are the, the different depositional environments at each moment of that sequence. And predicting the different depositional environments is, uh, is a major thing, is really not trivial, is really fundamental because by predicting the, the depositional environments, you predict the, the physical, uh, and not only physical, but maybe also biological, uh, geometrical, um, mineralogical, etc., etc., characteristics of your sediment. For instance, if you have a deep sea fan, uh, you, and you know deep sea fan from studying them on the field, for instance, uh, or in modern systems, you will have channels with certain geometric properties. You will have a certain suite of bed forms, you know, at the outcrop scale or at even seismic scale. You will have lobes. Um, you have a whole range of characteristics that is completely different from the, the physical properties of the sediment deposited in a barrier island context or in a fluvial dominated delta context. Okay, the, 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 your sediment here is going to be totally different from your sediment here and from your sediment here. Okay, so it's extremely predictive. If this is true, we always have to to say that at the beginning of, 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 of everything we, we say, we always have to say if this is true, okay? But there seems to be a lot of observation converging towards, towards this being actually the case. Then we can predict uh, a lot about the, 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 the properties of sediments uh, and their spatial organization on the, on the margin, uh, thanks to sequence stratigraphy. Okay, so we have a special partitioning of reservoir properties, facies and lithologies, and we have a special partitioning of reservoir volumes, reservoir sediments, you can exchange the, the words. The partitioning means the distribution, the special distribution of reservoir properties. So the special distribution of reservoir volumes. When we are in the low stand, our volumes are here. When we are transgressing, the volumes are distributed on thin layers everywhere on the shelf and in the fluvial system. And when we are in high stand, we partition volumes between the fluvial system, the coast, and some slope. Okay? And this is just a sketchy representation of what's going on. But if you dive into the sequence stratigraphy literature, you can become, you can really become ultra, ultra expert and professional and precise about, about the different aspects of this. One aspect that I highlight here is the shoreline trajectory concept. That has been, to my knowledge, developed uh, a lot by the Norwegians, uh, the Norwegian School of Sequence Stratigraphy. People like um, uh, Ole Martinsen, William Helen Hansen, um, um, I forgot one name, uh, one important name, uh, but uh, this, this, is a, this is a school, une école uh, of sequence stratigraphy that has, um, I think a lot driven by perhaps uh, um, teaching sequence stratigraphy and, and using it in the oil industry. Uh, uh, they have developed uh, a lot the idea of shoreline trajectory, which I find beautiful and which simply highlights the fact that you can follow uh, trajectories landward, uh, seaward, but you can follow trajectories of, your, uh, of some markers in your sediment uh, system, in your sedimentary system. Here, you know, this, this inflection point between something which has a low slope here and a, and a steeper slope there. This inflection point I drew here is even not clear to me uh, what it is. It could be the shelf edge, it could be the shoreline, okay? But it's anyway a marker, uh, a geometrical marker. And we can see it's going 
seaward, then landward, and then seaward again. Okay? And so that's shoreline trajectory. Now, um, so this is for the marine domain. And in the continental domain, things are maybe less easy to, to, to do. Sequence stratigraphy is maybe less easy to do. First, first one thing to mention is that sequence stratigraphy was first uh, developed onto passive continental margins. And actually, Vail and colleagues were actually doing shoreline trajectory, but they were also doing coastal on lap trajectory. Um, and they were very linked with uh, sea level. If you think about a fluvial system, like the one we've uh, discussed before, like this one. OK, a fluvial system has there's no big change from here to here in terms of sedimentation. OK, so in this dimension here, a long system, I don't see much. Where I see more in this dimension is in this dimension. In, it's across the system and not along the system. Because the major sedimentary, uh, sedimentary changes are between the channel and the floodplain. That's where I have the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest variation. I go from sand and uh, a high energy environment in the channel to a low energy, you know, very abruptly at the channel edge. So my main changes are across, you know, perpendicular to transport direction. Whereas on a passive margin like this one, the main changes, they open, they, they happen along the system from upstream to downstream. So in this system here, I represent a, a cross section that is perpendicular to sediment transport, whereas here it's parallel to sediment transport. And here, one of the ways to, to, to look at it and see a story is when you look at the degree of amalgamation of channels. And to my, uh, I haven't studied continental systems much, but to my uh, understanding, um, what we see often is, is a story of, of changing the degree of amalgamation. Basically, you can have very amalgamated channels and less amalgamated. Amalgamated means that you have one on top of each other, you know, they are, there is very little vertical aggradation. They tend to, they, they tend to follow each other and erode each other and deposit on top of each other with little space for the floodplain. Whereas then here, you have a channel with a lot of preservation of its floodplain and then, and then there is an aversion and it jumps here and then it jumps here and they are even disconnected. Okay, so there is a big literature on what controls this, uh, like what are called the leader Allen bridge uh, models. Um, and sorry, there is a fourth author uh, that I forgot. Uh, but there is the leader Allen bridge models that say that this stratigraphic pattern here, what controls whether it's amalgamated or, or less amalgamated, uh, basically uh, subsidence, base level rise, and the rate of avulsion. Okay, but let's be let's remain descriptive and just just uh, just stay with this that we can define amalgamated and non-amalgamated. And the idea still is that we have more accommodation. Often we will have more accommodation, more, more space for sedimentation here and less space for sedimentation here. Okay. 
what controls these changes in accommodation uh, and amalgamation is to be found. Okay, this is to this is discussed at the moment. Uh, but I think uh, this is for you important to recognize these kind of sequences. And again, here I don't have a scale. This could be 10 meta, you know, channel, channel size, and this could be 100 meters. But we, we could have also cycles of amalgamation, the amalgamation at a bigger scale. <laughs>